The Science of Being Well by Wallace D. Wattle. Chapter 9 continued. They enjoyed their breakfast as the toper enjoys his morning dram, because it gratifies an habitual appetite and not because it supplies a natural want. It is their best meal for the same reason that his morning dram is the toper's best drink. And they can get along without it because millions of people of every trade and profession do get along without it and are vastly better for doing so. If you are to live according to the science of being well, you must never eat until you have an earned hunger. But if I do not eat on rising in the morning, when shall I take my first meal? In 99 cases out of 100, 12 o'clock noon is early enough, and it is generally the most convenient time. If you are doing heavy work, you will get by noon a hunger sufficient to justify a good-sized meal, and if your work is light, you will probably still have hunger enough for a moderate meal. The best general rule or law that can be laid down is that you should eat your first meal of the day at noon if you are hungry, and if you are not hungry, wait until you become so. And when shall I eat my second meal? Not at all, unless you're hungry for it, and that with a genuine earned hunger. If you do get hungry for a second meal, eat at the most convenient time, but do not eat until you have really earned hunger. The reader who wishes to fully inform himself as to the reasons for this way of arranging the meal times will find the best books thereon cited in the preface to this work. From the foregoing, however, you can easily see that the science of being well readily answers the question, when and how often shall I eat? The answer is, eat when you have an earned hunger, and never eat at any other time. Chapter 10, What to Eat. The current sciences of medicine and hygiene have made no progress toward answering the question, what shall I eat? The contest between the vegetarians and the meat-eaters, the cooked food advocates, the raw food advocates, and various other schools of theorists seem to be interminable, and from the mountains of evidence and argument piled up for and against each special theory, it is plain that if we depend upon these scientists, we shall never know what is the natural food of man. Turning away from the whole controversy, then, we shall ask the question of nature herself, and we shall find that she has not left us without an answer. Most of the errors of dietary scientists grow out of the false premise as to the natural state of man. It is assumed that civilization and mental development are unnatural things, and that the man who lives in a modern house in a city or country, and who works in a modern trade or industry for his living, is leading an unnatural life, and is in an unnatural environment that the only natural man is a naked savage, and that the further we get from the savage, the farther we are from nature. This is wrong. The man who has all that art and science can give him is leading the most natural life because he is living most completely in all his faculties. The dweller in a well-appointed city flat with modern conveniences and good ventilation is living a far more naturally human life than the Australian savage who lives in a hollow tree or hole in the ground. Do you agree or disagree with the author? Have you enjoyed this video? Can you tell I'm reading it without my teeth then? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed it, your friends may enjoy it as well. Let them know about it by liking and sharing this video as it helps grow the family. And as always, to be sure you never miss one of these videos, please click the subscribe button. (laughs) You need to subscribe to this channel. You need to subscribe to this channel. You need to subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to the Artistic Biker now. Click the buttons.